It is. Uh, it's good for me to be able to be with you in Australia. I get to celebrate Father's Day twice that way. And I get to celebrate the start of spring twice that way. So, yeah, unfortunately, I also got to celebrate winter twice. I've noticed it seems to rain a lot in Perth every time I'm here. I'm wondering if you have sunny days. Just checking. I want to welcome you, uh, those of you who are here online, also those of you who are watching with us from Marawa. But uh, this morning, I want to talk about the Father's love since it is Father's Day. Um, a lot of us, I think, our image of our Father in heaven is largely shaped by our image of our Father figures. The problem is he's perfect and all the rest of us fathers are not. So it often distorts our image a little bit. In my own spiritual journey, I got to a place when I was probably in my late 30s where I realized my relationship with God, the three members of the Trinity, wasn't equal. There was one member of the Trinity that I didn't connect with as deeply as the other two. I connected deeply with Jesus when I surrendered my life to Christ. I experienced this overwhelming outpouring of the love of Christ. It was utterly transformational. So I always connected with Jesus. I connected with the Spirit. I could hear his voice, sense his presence. But the Father always felt distant from me. You know, if you had said to me, like, word association, when I say Heavenly Father, what comes to mind? I mean, I could have given a lot of good biblical answers. He's good. He's holy. He's sovereign. There was a lot of stuff that I knew. I mean, I'd read the Bible dozens and dozens of times by that point in my life. But if I was also self-aware and honest, I would have said to you, he feels a little distant, maybe even a little scary if I'm honest. And there was this gap between the Father and I that I didn't experience with Jesus or the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I started noticing it because of the way I was praying. When I would pray, I would just call the Father God, but it was distant. And one day when this occurred to me, I started saying this to Jesus. I don't know the Father like you know the Father. I read the Gospels, and I see the way you speak of him. I see the way you describe him, and I realize I don't really know him like that. I need you to show me the Father. And that began a journey for me to kind of heal it. Now, you know, for me, probably one of the reasons why this was the case where I felt distant from the Father was because growing up, my own earthly father was an angry guy. Now, he's radically changed. But again, a lot of times the image that you carry of the Heavenly Father has been impacted by the way you interacted with your earthly father. And a lot of times, especially in the early years, they're developmental. And so there was that sense in which the father just wasn't the same as the other two members of the Trinity for me. And so this morning, what I want to take a look at on Father's Day is I want to take a look at how we can close some of the gaps that occur with just having earthly fathers that are not perfect. Listen, I, I've been a dad for a long time. I have four kids. Uh, my oldest will be 29. And, you know, I love my kids to death, but I'm not a perfect father. And the reality is they need to close the gap as much as I've tried to reflect the father well to them. I'm not perfect. And they have a gap between who I am as their father and who the father in heaven really is. And they have to close the gap just like I did. And when you are not experiencing the revelatory love of the Father, your intimacy with God is always going to be impacted by that, okay? And so I want to take a look at this. I want to spend a little bit of time looking at some passages today in, uh, in Romans, and I particularly want to look at Romans chapter 8, because Paul talks about some things here that can help us close the gap between those two uh, fathers there, the earthly father figures and the heavenly father. This is what Paul writes. He said, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves 
so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Listen, when we put our faith in Jesus, the spirit of God, the very spirit of Jesus is deposited in us. And that spirit within us, he says, no longer makes us afraid to approach God. You know, whenever you carry stuff in your soul like sin, and we all do, and there's shame, which we all carry, it makes God feel unapproachable. With this, he says, now the spirit has been deposited in you to close the gap so you can now sense the father longs for relationship with you. This is the spirit of adoption, Paul refers to him as. And you notice he says, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. That is a specific Greek word. It has to do with firstborn son status. That's why he uses sonship. He doesn't say you're adopted as children, and the translation here is correct because of the technical Greek word that they're translating. What he's saying to us is, listen, the same spirit that is in Jesus has been deposited in you so that when you approach the Father, you come just like Jesus comes, as a firstborn son. You come in the name of Jesus, and when the Father sees you, he sees you covered with Jesus, and he welcomes you. And then the Spirit, he says, within us cries out, Abba, Father, which of course is how Jesus addressed his Father, Daddy, Papa, intimate little kid's phrase there. He goes on to say, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Listen, when you follow Jesus, it never guarantees you life without pain. Let me help you for a second really fast, okay? Life is going to be painful whether you follow Jesus or you don't. Because we live in a sinful world and it's fallen and it's broken. And there's disease and there's sickness and there's heartache and there's pain and people hurt you and you hurt other people. There will always be pain in life. You follow Jesus, it doesn't guarantee you pain-free existence. But you will have his presence with you. You will be deeply loved and you're adopted into the family. And someday, he says, we get to share in his glory. But we have to be willing to follow the God of the cross. We have to be willing to suffer well, too, because it is part of life. And that was part of Jesus. I want to look at, you know, how we can close the gap now between the father that we had and, you know, who tried his best, perhaps, and our earthly father and how we can begin to reveal, understand, and experience the revelation of the father's love. Here's his point in this passage that we just read. You know, if the Father pours out His Spirit within us, gives us His Spirit, part of the role of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the Father's love so that we can connect with God as His children and live as heirs of God, he says, co-heirs of Christ. By the way, the, the concept of being a co-heir of Christ, the stuff that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. I mean, this is a mind-boggling concept. But when you're an heir of God, and the co-heir with Christ, the stuff that Jesus has access to, you have access to because you are. Mike's out. There we go. Back. Good. So hear me. Sometimes the problem is we aren't experiencing the adoptive love of the Father because we have blocks in our soul. And I want to address that very briefly. I'm not going to spend long with it because I want to spend mostly how to receive the revelation. But let me start with the blocks, okay? I use this image a lot when I talk about soul care. Your soul is like a suitcase. I use the image because I travel all the time, right? I just finished a three-week trip. Today, I fly back home, starting with a midnight trip out of here tonight. I got 29 hours of flight before I finally, wheels up, wheels down, 29 hours, I finally get home back in New York, right? Three weeks here, the suitcase is now full of dirty laundry, right? 
It came, everything was clean. One point in the trip, because it was three weeks, we did laundry, and I did it just in time so that I could wear everything in the suitcase. Now it's all dirty. Listen to me. Saturday, I got to make another trip. Before I can make the next trip on Saturday, I got to unpack the dirty laundry. If I don't unpack the dirty laundry, there's no room for the nice, neat, clean, folded clothes that I need for my next trip. If I stuff nice, neat, folded clothes in that suitcase full, there won't be room, number one. And number two, whatever I could get in there is going to be contaminated by the dirty clothes. You tracking with me? Okay, please hear me. You have to take out the old dirty laundry before you can experience who you are in Christ. If you want the freedom and the fullness, if you want the love and the joy and the peace that is available to you as an heir of God, co-heir of Christ, if you want to experience what the Father is like with all his tender affections for you, you've got to unpack the dirty laundry in your life. For a lot of us, the problem is we have stuff in the suitcase like shame, you know, and sometimes we have shame because of the things we've done. Everybody in this room has done things that they're not proud of, and if that's not true of you, come see me, I'll help you. <laughs> you have done things you're not proud of, if you're honest. The problem is, for a lot of us, we never really processed that. We never really felt forgiven for that. Even though we may have confessed it, we still feel bad about it. And now we're carrying it in our suitcase like shame. For some of us, the shame has occurred in our life, not just because of what we've done, but because other people have done things to us, said things to us, and we're carrying around shame. Here's the problem with shame, right? Shame's like Teflon. Nothing sticks to Teflon. Whatever you put on, it just slides off. And here, I'll give you another image. Shame is like having your soul change the image from a suitcase. Your soul's like a bucket. Shame often is like having a hole in the bottom of the bucket. And whatever you pour into the bucket doesn't stick. It slips out. And a lot of us are having a hard time experiencing the revelatory love of the Father and feeling like deeply loved children of God because we have shame, and it's got a hole in the bottom of the bucket even when we experience knowledge of God's love, it's like it never solidifies us because it slips away. And you got to unpack that stuff. I'm just going to give you a word to the wise, okay? If you've never worked through, not read, work through my book, Soul Care, I would highly recommend it. It helps you to unpack. You can't read it like a novel. You actually have to do the work, Okay. And I would highly recommend you do it. Listen, for me personally, I carried a lot of this stuff in my soul. Soul care helped me to unpack it. All I'm doing in the book is telling you how I figured out how to do this in my life. And it's very testimonial. But I don't have time to talk about that today. So you, go read the book. Okay? Now, given that, let's talk about the other side of this equation. How, how do we experience the revelatory love of God? That's what I want to do. How do we receive what is promised in this passage, that the Holy Spirit is revealing God's adoptive love. How do we receive it? So let me give you three paths forward. You ready? Number one, you receive the adoptive love of the Father when the Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture to us. So I'll give you an example in my own life, but one day I was meditating. I was at a monastery. I go on retreats regularly, and I, go to the, I used to go when I was in Massachusetts as a pastor to this one monastery on a regular basis. And I was there on a couple days alone with God. I'm sitting at the monastery, and I had realized there's this gap between the way I experience the Heavenly Father and the way Jesus is experiencing Him. And so... I had started meditating on Scripture, and I was meditating on the passage we just read in Romans chapter 8, and all I was doing was reading the passage slowly and kind of lingering, and what I was waiting for was revelation, because that's what Romans 8 promises, and a lot of times when you're reading Scripture, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit will stir in you, a phrase will jump out at you, and it's the Spirit trying to personalize that passage to you. He's trying to take it from your head as knowledge and sink it into your heart as revelation. That's the illumination of the Holy Spirit through the Scripture, right? And that's what I was waiting for. And I'm sitting there, and this phrase jumped off the page at me, co-heirs. And I'm sitting there just lingering with the phrase, we are co-heirs of Christ. 
And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden my phone rang, and I look at my screen, and it's my second daughter, Courtney. Now, you have to understand, at the monastery that I went to, there was no phone signal. I'm in the middle of the woods. I mean, it is nothing nearby. My phone rang only once there in all the many, many years that I visited this monastery. But I'm sitting there meditating. All of a sudden, the phone rings. I look down. It's my daughter, Courtney. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to hold a conversation with her because this is not going to last, this signal. So I pick up the phone really quick. I said to her, Courtney, listen, I'm at the monastery. This signal is not going to last. I'm going to call you back from the monastery phone. Your caller ID is going to say the Most Holy Trinity Monastery. It is not the monk it's me, pick it up. And I hung up. I go out in the other room. I make a phone call. I'm sitting with Courtney. She's, you know, at the time, probably like 13 years old, you know, this was way back. But she's processing and talking to me about stuff going on in school and what. And then when I finish, I go back in and I pick up where I left off and I'm meditating on the passage. We are co-heirs with Christ. And all of a sudden it hits me. Listen, can I tell you something? If it was anybody else's name on the caller ID, I would not have picked up the phone. The only reason why I picked up that phone that day in the middle of my sacred space was because that name carried my own name. That was my kid. Courtney Reamer picked up that phone, so I picked it up because it's my own child. And as I'm reading, we are co-heirs with Christ, I realize Courtney gets access to my sacred places because she's my child. And in the same way, we are co-heirs with Christ, and we get access to the sacred place of the Father, just like Jesus, because we are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Listen, let me just tell you something. If you actually believe this stuff, it would change the way you interacted with God. And that's what I needed, you know. So I was meditating on this, and the Lord was giving me fresh revelation. Let's talk about the second way we can receive the revelation of the Father's adoptive love to help secure us and close the gap between our imperfect earthly fathers that represent the Father to us and our own heavenly Father. We receive the adoptive love of the Father when the Holy Spirit speaks directly to us about it. So on the one hand... He speaks to us through the scripture. But on the other hand, he actually speaks through direct revelation. The Holy Spirit speaks directly to us. Paul talks about this in verse 16 when he says, the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are deeply loved children of God. He testifies. Think about a testimony for a second, right? You're out here today and somebody has an accident and you witness the accident. What do you do? You tell what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. But notice, a testimony is a verbal witness of what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing. He's giving you a witness to what he's seen, what he's heard, what he's experienced about you and your relationship with God in the heavenly realms. Listen, please hear me. You and I both, we do stuff sometimes that is regrettable. You do stuff that is wrong. And when you do it, lots of times, right, the enemy comes at you and he accuses you. He starts coming after you. He says, you call yourself a Christian. Look at what you do. You are a filthy person. And then you start to feel bad, right? But hear me. I want you to hear me, okay? The Holy Spirit is also trying to speak to you. Just as the enemy is trying to condemn you and shame you and make you feel lousy, the Holy Spirit is testifying about what he's heard about you in the heavenlies. When the enemy of your soul has appeared before your father's throne in heaven and he's made an accusation, the Holy Spirit is present when he sees Jesus as the accusation comes against you. Jesus, the one with the nail prints on his hand, who has taken the punishment for your sin, who has absorbed your sin in his holy body, that you might become God's righteousness. He sees Jesus hold up his hand in the face of the enemy and he says, no, no, you won't accuse that one. That one belongs to me. I paid the price. He hears the father say, no, no, that one I've adopted. That one is cloaked with Christ. When I see them, I no longer see what they've done against me. What I see is what Jesus has done for them. See, he's heard this stuff. He's watched this scene play out in the heavenlies over and over and over. And he's trying to talk to you about it. 
But hear me, hear me, hear me. If you don't remove the junk from the suitcase of your soul, you are deflecting the testimony of the Holy Spirit. You're trying to talk yourself out of the things he's trying to talk you into. This is why you need to deal with your issues. When I first really surrendered my life to Christ, you know, one of the practices that I picked up pretty early was just every day trying to listen to the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's because I kept reading places in Scripture where it talked about the Holy Spirit speaks. John 10, 27, my sheep will know my voice. John 14 through 16, Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit says, he will teach you, lead you, guide you, make known to you, reveal to you. And it's all communication stuff. So every day I would sit with the Lord and I would just spend time quietly, not long, just five, ten minutes, just sit quietly and ask the Holy Spirit to speak. It's again, it's a promise in the Bible. And I would wait on the Lord. Do you know what I heard every single day? Almost without fail, I love you. Every day I would sit before the Lord and I'd listen. And the first thing he would say, I love you. This went on for years. I love you. Next day, I love you. Next day, I love you. Next day, I love you. I'm years into this thing, and one day, it just occurs to me, like, I get this every day, and, and what I would do is write down what I sense the Holy Spirit speak, and he would say other stuff, but every day, it started with this, I love you, and I'd write it down, I love you, and I'd write it down, and one year, I, I'm sitting there, I was a brand new dad, I had a, a, a baby that was, you know, about two months old, and it's the middle of the night, and she gets up in the middle of the night, screaming her head off, it's the most irrational thing in all the world, the love of a parent. It's completely irrational. Only a kid could get up and scream, wake you up, ruin a night's sleep, and you still love them. It's completely irrational. And so I have this kid, and I'm sitting there, and I'm holding her in my arms, and I hear Jesus say once again, this is how the Father feels about you. I'm feeling this incredible, overwhelming love. And he says, this is how the Father feels about you. I love you. That's how he feels. And he wants to testify to that. So you got to listen to the Holy Spirit, okay? One last thing, and with this one I'll close. If we want to receive the revelation of the Father's love, we should really spend some time in the Scriptures and actually meditate on Scripture. Let the Holy Spirit bring revelation to us there. We should listen to the Holy Spirit because he's trying to testify how much he loves you. And then lastly, we need to receive the adoptive love of the Father through an outpouring of his love. Romans 5, earlier in this letter to the church at Rome, Paul said that the Holy Spirit pours out the love of God in our hearts. This isn't just a revelation or an illumination. This is like a downpour. And again, it's a promise. So, you know, when I hit that season where I realized there was a gap between the way I viewed the Heavenly Father and the way I experienced it, I just said to the Father, you know, you need, to, you need to fulfill this promise in my life. If I'm ever going to understand your love, I need you to pour out the love of the Father, Holy Spirit, in my heart. And I prayed that for months. And one of the things that I think happens in our relationship with God, we press in for a little bit, it gets hard, and we pull back. If you ever want breakthrough, you got to press in and press through. You can't quit. And so I persisted for months and months and months in praying. And then one day, I had a dream. Both Old and New Testament, God speaks to people through dreams. It's very common, actually. And um, I've had, you know, a couple dozen dreams in my life that I knew were from God, but none of them ever impacted me like this one. In the dream, I was speaking at a men's retreat, and all dreams are very symbolic. You always have to unpack the symbolism. The reason why I'm speaking at a men's retreat is because, again, your soul is like a bucket. I had a hole in the bottom of my soul because of shame, and it was connected to a wound in my identity. Because I'm a man, it's a masculine wound, right? Because I'm a man. So I'm at this retreat, and I'm speaking to men because it represents the hole that's there, the masculine wound. So that took me a while to figure it out, but that's what it was. I'm leaving at the time. I come off the stage. I'm leaving, and there's all these guys in the room, only men, and they're all giving me hugs, but they're giving me a man hug. You know what a man hug is? Three pats, and you're done. Anything more than that is definitely suspicious. So, you know, three and out. And they're good hard pats, you know, boom, 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 right? And you know what? That also was symbolic. It was symbolic of a low level of intimacy that I was comfortable with. You know, one of the things that happens when you're carrying around junk in your suitcase, you're always afraid of getting found out. Like if somebody finds out who you really are, they're not going to love you. So therefore, you're not really comfortable with really deep, close, intimate encounters emotionally. And if people kind of get a little too close, you start to feel a little squirrely. 
And so that was symbolic too. I make my way through the crowd, hang up, you know, I finish hugging all these guys. I get outside. There's one guy outside that I knew. He's the only guy in the dream that I knew. And again, people in dreams are also very symbolic. This guy did not represent himself. He represented something else. Well, all you need to know about him to figure out what he represented was he was one of my most vociferous critics. Literally, one day, this guy took me out to breakfast, and he had a legal pad with him, and uh, the title of the legal pad, I kid you not, was 21 Things You Suck At. <laughs> this is going to be a fun conversation, right? And he just walks through the list, you know, you suck at this, and let me illustrate how, you suck at this, and let me explain why, and you know, he goes through, it took him over two hours to walk through his list. He's not yelling or screaming, he's very matter of fact, actually. Afterwards, I just looked at him, I go, do you even like me? He goes, oh, this isn't personal. <laughs> oh, thank God, imagine if it were, I could have gotten hurt. We use the phrase, we say, what you don't know won't hurt you, what you don't know is killing you, and it's killing everybody around you. But you see, this guy didn't represent himself. You know what he represented? The critic within. You know, one of the things that happens with shame, shame always blames. You're either going to blame God, or you're going to blame people, or you're going to blame yourself with critical, negative judgments over your life. But you see, shame hasn't gotten to the place where you have security and you've accepted the Father's love, so there's always blame going on. And I was my own worst critic. I didn't blame God. I didn't blame others. It was me. I was hard on myself. He's funny. He's the only guy in the room I didn't hug. You know why you can't hug? I couldn't make peace with shame. You've got to put shame to death. Because all shame is is pride wrapped in self-disgust. You're just making life too much about you. So I walk past him. I get out in the parking lot. There's one last guy in the parking lot. He's an older guy. He gives me a hug like everybody else, you know. The only problem was nobody taught him the man hug rules. He's got me, man. He has got me in a tight grasp and an uncomfortably long hug, way too close, way too long. And I'm telling you, man, my skin is crawling, and I'm just like wanting to take this guy and throw him to the ground and run away. And all of a sudden, he disembraces, but he still got me by the shoulder. He not let me go, but he disembraces so he can look me right in the eye, and he says, I am your Father in heaven, and I love you. I woke up. My pillow was drenched, man. I just fell in his arms and started sobbing. I got up from that dream. I walked downstairs in the dark in my living room, and I sat in my living room in about a two-hour outpouring of the tender love of the Father. And it changed me forever. If you did a word association with me today and you just say, when I say Father in heaven, what comes to mind? I mean, without exception, the very first phrase that always comes to my mind is tender affections. I don't say it because I read about it in somebody's book or in the Bible. I say it because I've experienced it. I know what it feels like to have the love of God poured out in my heart. I know firsthand the tender affections of the Father. And when that happened, man, it sealed something inside of my relationship with the Father that I couldn't get to without that. Listen, for some of us, in order for us to get the revelatory love of the Father, we've got some unpacking to do. You know, for me, I had some stuff in there like shame that I had to address, and I was addressing it. And after you do some unpacking, man, you also got to do some of this where you're lingering in Scripture and meditating. You need the Holy Spirit to reveal the love of the Father. And then you also need some revelation, but some of us, we need an encounter. Listen, a lot of our earthly fathers weren't bad, but they're not perfect. And there's always this gap between who we are as earthly fathers and who the Father in heaven is, and only the Holy Spirit can close that gap. Let me pray with you today. Just put your hand over your heart for a second. Come, Holy Spirit. All of us, Lord, you know, we've had father figures in our life. I have been, and many of us in the room have been a father figure. It is my desire to represent you well, Father. 
to everybody around me. But I don't do it perfectly. I'm a sinner. And I'm flawed. And every single one of us, including my own children, every single one of us needs the Holy Spirit to close the gap between the fathers we have experienced on this realm called earth and our Father from heaven who's totally perfect and different. So I pray we wouldn't just know these things about our heavenly Father, but by the Holy Spirit's revelation, each of us over these next days and weeks and months and years would have this continuous revelatory experiential knowing of the tender affections of the Father. That we might be heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, and walk out the fullness of our adoptive identity in Christ's name. Amen.